Okay, guys, so I uh, made a little video here for you about Listen 2.7. I hope um, you'll be able to understand all this by the time we're done here. Uh, in any case, so Listen 2.7 <coughs> is very much a continuation of what we did in Listen 2.6 except that we're looking at some more complicated polynomials to solve. And so this brings us to a theorem that allows us to uh, analyze and understand how polynomials work in general a little bit better. It's called the Fundamental Theorem of Algebra, um, which there's a Fundamental Theorem of Calculus as well. It's a very important theorem. Uh, to calculus, this is a very important theorem. To algebra, very important for us. It tells us that basically um, it doesn't matter what polynomial f of x is, if it has degree n, as long as n is greater than 0, then the equation, when I set it equal to 0, so f of x equals 0, has at least one solution in the set of complex numbers. So that tells us that Every polynomial, no matter what its degree, has at least one solution that's complex. And then there's a corollary that says uh, if f of x is a polynomial of degree n, where n is greater than 0, then f of x equals 0 has exactly, now this is very different information, okay, exactly n solutions, provided that each solution repeated twice is counted as two solutions, and each solution repeated three times is counted as three solutions, and so on. Um, so, what does that actually mean? Uh, and so let's talk about the corollary, this explanation here. The corollary implies that an nth degree polynomial has exactly n zeros. Okay, but n zeros as in some of them could be repeated, some of them could be imaginary, some of them could be real, and so on. <clears throat> so, <clears throat> what that means is, um, if I have a polynomial like this, uh, let me write it out like this, f of x equals x plus 1 times x plus 3 squared. Okay, if I have a polynomial like this, this is the factored form of the polynomial, uh, then this polynomial's degree, actually if you expanded it, it would look like this. If I multiplied the parentheses out, it would look like this. x cubed plus 7x squared plus 15x plus 9. This is a third degree polynomial. Okay, so the degree is 3. And this corollary says if the degree is 3, then it must have three solutions, exactly three solutions. All right. Now, if we were to take this, you would say that and put it equal to 0, put it equal to 0 as stated here. Okay. If I put this equal to zero by the zero product property, I would get this. And we would usually just write x is negative one. If I take the square root here, I get x plus three equals zero, so that would be x equals negative three. Okay? Now, this looks like two solutions, not three. The corollary says there must be three solutions. But since this is second power, it means that this solution occurs twice. So we would actually write, here are the three solutions. x is negative 1, x is negative 3, and we count this twice because this tells me that there are two of them. Okay, It occurs twice. You'll see a little bit later um, when we talk about multiplicity how that's also useful to us. So technically this polynomial has three solutions. That's what the corollary and the fundamental theorem of algebra tells us. Okay, and so uh, the example one is probably the easiest example you've ever done. It's just saying, <coughs> look at the polynomial and determine how many solutions are zeros. 
So remember, if, uh, if we set an equation equal to zero, we call these solutions, and we call these zeros because it comes from a polynomial function. A function has zeros, and an equation has solutions. It means the same thing, essentially, but we just have different names for them when they look different. Okay? But so the question is, find the number of zeros. Well, the corollary says, if the degree is n, then it has exactly n zeros. So the degree here is 4. So there are four solutions to this polynomial. Now this may seem ridiculous, but it's useful when you're solving polynomials to know how many answers am I supposed to get. Okay, And then here, um, same thing, the degree here is 3, which implies three zeros okay, by the corollary to the fundamental theorem of algebra. And then here, the degree is 6 which implies six zeros, okay? So I would get x equal, x equal six times. That's what this says. That's it, it's that simple. So just know that when you look at a polynomial, it has <clears throat> the same number of solutions as its degree, but those solutions can be real or imaginary, okay? All right, so uh, example two, is a calculator example. Uh, you are supposed to graph this in your graphing calculator. Okay, graph this in your graphing calculator. And then um, also analyze it and then also understand what is this information they're giving me. Maybe you're going to graph two things in your calculator um, and then find the solution. So remember, this is an applied word problem. Uh, we don't want to try and graph polynomials like this by hand. Uh, plotting a table of points or something, that's ridiculous. So you do it with technology. Now you should be doing this on your calculator, so you practice. We've done this actually quite a few times before. I think I'm going to have to use Desmos uh, to do it because I don't really have the graphing calculator software here on my computer. So I'm going to do it on Desmos. But you can follow along on your graphing calculator. Uh, X cubed minus 0 0.225 X squared plus 3.62 X minus 11.0. Okay. So, what does this say? So let's read it together. It says tachometer, I think that's how you pronounce it, measures the speed and revolutions per minute, okay, speed and revolutions per minute, uh, at which an engine shaft rotates, so the speed that the shaft is rotating at, okay. Uh, for a certain boat, the speed x of the engine shaft in RPMs, so x is the speed of the engine shaft, okay, in RPMs, and the speed s of the boat in miles per hour. So s is how fast the boat is traveling. Okay, this is the speed of the boat. And this is the speed of the engine shaft. And those two are modeled by this equation right here. Okay, so this is the speed of the boat. Right here. And all the x's here represent, oh, that's not an x. All the x's here represent the speed of the shaft, the engine shaft inside the engine. Okay? That's what they all represent. So then they say, what is the reading when the boat travels 15 miles per hour? So boat travels 15 miles per hour. Uh, that is the speed of the boat. Okay? And so what they're asking for, tachymeter reading, is the speed of the shaft. Well, speed of the shaft is an x value they're asking for, and they basically told you an s sub x value, which on your calculator or in Desmos or something like that would be a y value. 
Now we said when you are given a y value and asked for an x value, you graph y equals 15. So we can come here and graph y equals 15 as well. Okay, uh, let's see. Okay, I think that's gonna work. But now you can see our graph doesn't fit. Okay, so we have to zoom out and do things. Hmm, I don't know why this is not working. Michael, there it is, okay? And so what you're doing now on your graphing calculator is not as easy as Desmos. You should practice this on your graphing calculator like we did in class several times. But what you wanna do is find the intersection point of the function, this function, that represents the speed of the boat and um, the line y equals 15. And what you do when you get that is you find the intersection point is at 19.863 and 15. So when the speed of the boat, this is the speed of the boat function, when that uh, becomes 15, the x value, the rotational speed of the shaft in revolutions per minute, is 19.863. Okay, so uh, using our calculator, we said x is about, let me go back here, x is about 19.863, right? But if you read this, it's measured in hundreds of revolutions per minute. So 19.863 needs to be multiplied by 100 to write it in revolutions per minute. Okay, So you can write uh, the speed of the shaft is 19.86.3 uh, RPMs. Okay, revolutions per minute. So that's really the answer, even though uh, on your calculator or Desmos, whatever, you get 19.863, but it really means the speed of the shaft is that number times 100, which is 1986.3 uh, revolutions per minute. So when the boat is traveling 15 miles per hour, the shaft is spinning at that speed. This is very, very useful information. This is how uh, and why we use polynomials, because they solve real-world problems for us, okay? Please remember, we're always trying to do real-world stuff, not waste your time just manipulating numbers or playing with technology. All right, <clears throat> so that's example two. Now, we have to ex discuss something that's not in your textbook at all, and that's multiplicity of zeros. This really helps you understand polynomial graphs better, polynomial functions better, and you use this information to solve polynomials. So when we get to example uh, four down here, uh, you can't really understand how to solve this if you don't understand multiplicity of zeros. Okay, I'm gonna try and keep this uh, quite brief. There's a lot of writing on the page. You should read through it carefully on your own. Um, I shouldn't really have to uh, explain every single little thing here to you. Read it, try and understand it, but I'll also try my best to make it clear to you, okay? So just like we said earlier, <coughs> if I have a polynomial function like this and I factor it, it looks like that, all right? Now, factoring it is also difficult. This is just for illustration, illustration purposes. Being able to go from the polynomial to its factored form is already a difficult thing, okay? But let's assume you know how to factor it. Um, it looks like this. Now we know that the function is supposed to have four solutions, okay, or four zeros in this case, because it's a function, four zeros. Um, and we have them, here they are, okay. This is x equals negative one, and then this would be x equals negative three, three times. Okay, remember if it occurs, if it has a three, it occurs three times, all right? So you can write it like this down here. <coughs> Now, well, what does this mean to us uh, when I look at this graphically? What does it look like and how can I use this information? Okay, so when I have something like this happening, if I graph it, I get that. All right? And what it tells me is, if I look at the graph where x equals negative 1, so in other words, this parenthesis here, uh, the function crosses straight through the x-axis. Okay. All right, and when uh, x minus 3 has power 3, 
the function still crosses through the x-axis, but it does a little bit of a flattening out here uh, at the x-axis. Both of those are an odd number of solutions. Okay, so <clears throat> let's look at this again. This solution occurs three times from the power, and this solution occurs one time, so, or once. So both of those solutions have an odd number of occurrences. Okay, and what we see is whenever that happens, um, you get a, the function crosses the x-axis. So because this solution occurs once, and because this solution occurs three times, as in power three over here, okay, then we know that if any uh, zero or solution occurs an odd number of times, the graph of that function will cross the x-axis. But you can also tell something different. Um, you can say you can visually see that there's a difference between this zero and this zero without knowing this information, without already knowing the factored form. I can go straight from. So let me delete some of these lines here. I can go straight from here. I can go straight from the original polynomial and say I'm looking at the graph. And based on this, I can know that uh, because the function goes straight through the x-axis here, I know that it occurs only once. It's odd number of times. Um, and um, if the function crosses through the x-axis but it flattens out like this, I can know that if that 0, 3, occurs more than once, but it's an odd number of times. Odd because the function is crossing the x-axis. Okay, But I know that it's likely that it doesn't just occur once, but it occurs more than once. So if you're just looking at the graph, you don't know this number. You don't know that it occurs three times. I don't know this number. But I know that something is happening there that it occurs more than only once, probably three times or five times or more. But it must be an odd number of times that that zero occurs because the function crosses the x-axis. Okay, So to summarize, it's pretty tricky, but to summarize, what we're saying is um, if the function crosses the x-axis, then this zero has odd multiplicity. Here's the word for it, Okay, odd multiplicity. All right, so the function crosses the axis here because it crosses. I know that it's odd multiplicity, but because it goes straight through over here, I know that it's likely to be multiplicity of one. That zero only occurs once, but because it flattens out here when it crosses the x axis, I know that that multiplicity is likely to be uh, either three or five, or seven, or some other number. It's probably higher than one multiplicity here, because it crosses the x-axis and it flattens out when it does that. Okay, So we call this odd multiplicity, because the function crosses the x-axis. And we know the number of multiplicity by the shape that the function has when it crosses the x-axis. Something like that. I don't want to harp on about this too much. Okay. And then likewise for function for the polynomial like this, if the factored form is this, uh, we see there's odd multiplicity here, odd multiplicity here, but this is even multiplicity. So then what does the graph look like when the zero has even multiplicity? It occurs twice. So you can see the difference. This is x equals one, this is x equals negative three, uh, sorry, x equals yeah, that should be negative three. I guess I have the. Hmm. I guess I have the wrong equation here. I think this should be negative three. Here. Okay. Any case, so if I'm looking at this polynomial, I think this should be negative three because the zero is positive three. Okay. If I'm looking at this, what I see is that this has multiplicity one. This has multiplicity one. So these two zeros, the function is crossing the x-axis. This has even multiplicity. In other words, the zero would occur twice. Okay? And what happens is whenever a zero has even multiplicity, is the function touches the x-axis but does not cross the x-axis. Okay? Now, again, if I didn't know this information, okay, if I didn't know any of this information, 
and I went straight from the polynomial to its graph, then I wouldn't know exactly here um, what the multiplicity is. All I would know is that the multiplicity, the multiplicity is even. So it could be 2, or it could be 4, or it could be 6. I don't know the exact number of times that this 0 occurs, like I do when I factor it, just by looking at the graph. But it gives me useful information. I know that the multiplicity is either 2 or 4 or 6. Okay, So I know that that root occurs more than once. It's twice or 4 times or 6 times. And then here, because the function crosses straight through, no bending or curving or anything, I am fairly confident by looking at the graph that this multiplicity is odd and that it's likely to be 1 Okay, for both of these because it goes straight through. Because it crosses, it's odd multiplicity, and I'm fairly confident that it's 1 since it crosses straight through and there's no bending or whatever. Okay. Uh, think about that, look at that, read it carefully. Uh, hopefully you can understand this. All right? This is very, very important for what we're about to do next here. Okay? So let's uh, see if we can, based on that understanding, answer the question. So just classify the multiplicity of the zeros. That means tell me is it odd or even. That's it. All right. So I'm looking at this graph. Now this is kind of wild graph here on the left, letter A, but um, we're just zoomed in and looking at where the graph crosses the x-axis and trying to come up with the multiplicity of those zeros. So, from left to right, this must have even multiplicity, or that zero must occur an even number of times because the function touches uh, because um, f of x only touches the x-axis. Okay, it does not cross. And you can see here, just like in the other example, it doesn't quite touch exactly, it flattens out quite a bit here. Okay, it's not like our normal parabola style vertex kind of a thing. It flattens out. So it's likely that um, this multiplicity uh, could be probably 4 or 6 or 8 or something like that. Remember, it must be even, but something like that. It's likely that it's higher than 2, but we're just speculating at this point. Okay. Uh, and then here, uh, the function crosses straight through the x-axis, and so this multiplicity would be odd, and it's likely to be 1. And then here, it bends a little bit as it crosses so this multiplicity would still be odd, but it's maybe 3 or 5 or 7 or something like that, a higher number than just 1 because it flattens out. All right, and then lastly, this would be odd because the function crosses the x-axis, and it's likely to be maybe you know 3 or 5 or 7, something higher, because it doesn't just cross straight through the x-axis, it actually flattens out there. Okay, We don't know exactly what that number is, but as long as you know it's odd and it happens more than once, that should be sufficient.